If we haven't met before, my name's Beck. I'm one of the team here at Hope Centre, and I'm just so glad you're here with us today. If you're joining us online, thank you so much for taking the time to be with us in your week. I already met people here this morning here for the first time, so thank you. If you feel a bit like you don't know what's going on, that's okay. I don't either. And uh, we're just here. We're just... I'm joking. We just love that you're here, that you took the time to join us. Don't feel nervous. It's okay. You're welcome here. And uh, we just love the fact that you would be with us today. And so now we're going to open the Word of God together, the Bible. And we've been talking, uh, our text has been John 10.10, one of my all-time favorite scriptures. I have come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. It reads like this, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. And I have come, Jesus said, that they may have life and have it to the full. Amen. That they may have life and have it to the full. We've been talking for weeks now in this series about how we don't just believe in a God who cares about your eternity. He does care about your eternity so deeply that he sent his son Jesus to take our sin on the cross and defeat death so that we could live forever with him. But he doesn't just care about your eternity. He cares about the here and now. Jesus is saying in this scripture that he's come that not only would you have eternal life, but you would have a life right now and have it to the full. If you'd like a title for this morning's message, Flourishing Life is a Series, it's Border Force. Every graphic designer in the room just died a little bit on the inside. <laughs> but my text for you today is Proverbs chapter 4, verse 23. In the New King James Version, it says this, Keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it spring the issues of life. The NIV says it like this, above all else, say above all else, above all, I mean, that's a big call, right? Above all else, above all else, guard your heart for everything you do flows from it. Now, if you've been a believer, if you've been walking with Jesus for any amount of time, this is a scripture you've heard before. And like me, it's a scripture that I go, "Mm mm-hmm, yep, next. Because we read these things in Scripture like, above all else, guard your heart for everything you do flows from it. And we're like, yeah, of course, got it. I know, I know that. I know that my heart is really important. I should love Jesus. I should be kind to my neighbor. I got it. But there's more in here because to start this Scripture with the phrase, above all else, denotes a level of importance that I think I've missed before and you probably too. Above all else, guard your heart. What? What does that even mean? Am I the only one who reads scripture and asks those kind of questions? What does that even mean? What does guard your heart even mean? So my friend here, Gerard, Gerard the guard, is going to help me this morning explain to you and to me what on earth we're supposed to do about guarding your heart. Because I thought flourishing life was much more about the flowers. That's obtuse. Um... Much more about the flowers and less about the border force. Because flourishing life doesn't really sound like I have to do a lot. I just kind of hope that flowers appear and, you know, springtime and harvest and all of that. But guarding our heart is such an important part of our life if we want to truly flourish in walking with God. The thing is, Gerard is only useful, apart from Christmas carols, which are coming up very soon, by the way, It's a little promo. Gerard is only useful as a guard if there is something to guard against. I know that this Gerard here usually stands outside Buckingham Palace doing very important work like marching, turning around, waiting for the bell to go and then marching again. But... A guard is there because there is something valuable to guard. There is something valuable and there is an enemy which will try and get that value. So we can acknowledge, you and I can acknowledge, yes, my heart is very valuable. You know, the enemy is after my heart. 
God is after my heart. He wants us to serve him with our whole heart. We know all of these things. But what is the enemy of your heart? What are you guarding against? When Scripture says, above all else, guard your heart, what am I guarding against? Just bad things? Just random sins that will try and, you know, dive bomb you from weird angles? What are you and I guarding against? Well, the beginning of John 10, 10 says this, the thief comes only to steal and to kill and to destroy. You and I need to have a border force of our heart that says, enemy, thief, you will not come and steal and kill and destroy in my life. You don't have access here because above all else, Gerard is standing guard. Smile at me, this is okay. You're thinking, this is weird. It's okay. There's not going to be a dance. No. Jesus says there is a thief. 1 Peter 5, 8 says, Be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion for someone to devour. See, we're Pentecostals. We don't like to give, you know, too much credit to this enemy, this thief, this devil that Scripture talks about. We're not supposed to live in fear. We're not. You're not supposed to live, like, on guard in fear. And we, we you know... We of this generation, the social media generation, we fall prey to things like, you know, I'm not going to get in a toxic relationship because it's going to kill my heart. And, you know, like the great poet T.S. Wift has just written 85,000 tracks about broken hearts. We are, you know, we have this weird idea that guarding our heart is just putting up a big barbed wire fence and saying, ain't nobody getting in here. I'm better off by myself. I'm better off on my own. But scripture certainly doesn't teach that. It says things like carry one another's burdens. But I'm guarding my heart. See, the enemy is like a roaring lion. The truth is, he's not a roaring lion. There is one roaring lion, the lion of the tribe of Judah. The enemy is an imposter. He's like a roaring lion who will try and come to your life with temptation, with lies, with fear. And we have to say, that doesn't belong here. That doesn't come into my life. A long time ago, we used to live in a cul-de-sac. I say a long time ago, but it's very fresh in my mind. Uh, We used to live in a cul-de-sac and we had lovely neighbours. And you know that kind of like homely feeling where you're like, I can see over their front yard and I can see they're working on their car and the other car and seven cars that are in the front yard. And um, I can see they're mowing their lawn at 6am, praise the Lord. And uh, one of our neighbours used to have a cat. And... A few days in a row, I woke up at three o'clock in the morning and I thought, there's a crying baby outside. This is just not okay. Why would anybody in our cul-de-sac have a crying baby and bring them outside, right in front of the bedroom window? Why, why is this happening? And I'd look outside and I'm like, I can't see anything. I can't see anybody. It's... Occasionally, I like open the door like, is someone dropped a baby on my doorstep. Like, what is this going on? A few days into this, I figured out, that's not a crying baby, that's a cat. (laughs) I mean, that was the noise. Like, 3 a.m. in the morning, Pastor Luke, I I like sleeping. And um, right outside the door, I mean, like, the the blessing of (laughs) neighbours. This noise. And I am like, I love animals, but I'm going to kill that cat. just like the devil. He's not a roaring lion, but he will come and wake you up. He will come and annoy you. He will come and taunt you. He will come and say, you need to think about this fear. You need to think about this problem. You know what? Your life is a mess. You know what? Your heart is broken. You know what? This is going on. Ah, That noise, often at 3 a.m. in the morning. He's not a roaring lion. He's just an imposter. And every time I hear the devil come and talk to me, I think about that cat. Who was the devil, really? (sighs) 
See, Jesus says in John 10, 10, I'm the one that is going to bring you life and bring it to the full. But Proverbs says to me, you need to guard your heart. You need to take responsibility to set up boundaries. You need to take responsibility for what is precious in your life and say, you know what? Life is going to happen. The devil's going to come like a roaring lion or like an annoying cat. But I'm going to stand guard at the door of my heart and say, you know what? You don't get to encroach on this territory. You don't get to be a part of my life. You might live out there on the periphery, but I'm guarding what is precious, which is what is on the inside of me. John 16, 33 in the Amplified, Jesus is talking to, to his disciples and he says this, I have told you these things so that in me you may have perfect peace. In the world you have, this is the most wonderful part, tribulation, amen, and distress and suffering. Oh, thanks, Jesus. Thanks a lot. If you came here for a happy message today, it's coming. But Jesus is telling his disciples, you know what? Life is going to happen to you. The devil is going to prowl around like a roaring lion. Things are going to happen in your life that you don't want to happen. Things that you do want to happen in your life are going to feel like they're coming in eternity. And yet, he says this, but be courageous and take heart. I have overcome the world. Friend, today, we live in a normal planet. We live life like everybody else. If you're not a believer here today, if you, if you don't yet know Jesus, I'm not going to try and tell you that Jesus will make your life a bed of tulips and a bed of roses without the thorns and everything will just be rosy and wonderful forever. The Christian life is hard. Following Jesus is hard. The reality is that there's tribulation and there's suffering and there's distress. But friends, take heart. I have overcome the world. So there's three enemies of your heart that I want to talk to you about briefly this morning. And uh, hopefully you remember Gerard the guard when you go about your week this week and think, you know what, I'm just not letting them in. They might live out here on the other side of the fence. They might live on the outside of Buckingham Palace but they don't get to live on the inside of me. Is that all right? All right. Number one, we're going to dive in deep, straight in there. Disappointment. Disappointment will try and come and take up residence in your heart. Disappointment will come to you, knock on the door and say, can I please come inside? And you know what? Disappointment is not a short stay visitor. Disappointment makes a room, gets a bed, starts redecorating, putting up wallpaper, takes up three shelves in your fridge and your pantry and like, do not eat this food. It belongs to disappointment. It's just chips and chocolate and ice cream. <laughs> disappointment comes to your life and says, I want to come and live with you. I want to come and be with you. I want to come and take up residence with you. In fact, let's change our address to Disappointment Avenue at Disappointment 4650. It is so easy to feel disappointment in this life. I read through the Gospels and I'm like, just imagine for a second being a disciple. You're like, hey, it's Jesus. He's going to fix everything. And then there's scriptures like this. I've told you that you're going to have tribulation and distress and suffering. What? I did not sign up for that. I pray prayers like that to God all the time. Hey, God, can you fix this? I don't want this anymore. When disappointing things happen in my life. Oh, God, things that happen, things that didn't happen. We can easily allow disappointment to flourish in our heart if we don't guard against it. You know this is true. Some of you know people, don't point at them, please, who have a doormat that says, disappointment, welcome here. They go around finding new disappointments, inviting them in, saying, hey, come and live with me. We've got, there's a whole gang of us here. Disappointment from 1987, disappointment from 1993, disappointment from 2022. I mean, everybody had 2022 disappointment. Disappointment from 20... Hey, I've even got a room set aside for 2025 disappointment. Coming very soon. We know these people. They love it. Disappointment takes root in our heart and becomes disillusionment. Oh, yeah, of course. 
well, typical. That was always going to happen to me. Don't you know bad things happen in threes? They're like, come, be disappointing, please. Have you got a disappointment? Share it with me. I'll take it home. These people just love disappointment. But if we're going to live a flourishing life that truly takes a hold of John 10, 10, I would come that you would have life and have it to the full, you need to set up Gerard outside and say, disappointment is not welcome here. When tribulation comes, okay, let's call it, it's tribulation. It's suffering. It's distress. Hey, disappointment might even come to the front door. Don't welcome it in. Guard your heart, friends. Guard your heart because you know what? Out of it flows the rest of your life. If you allow disappointment in, oh, it'll bring friends. Romans 5 5 says this, and hope does not put us to shame. Why? Because, I love this underline in your Bible, because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. You might be here today and you say, I have, I have had my fair share of disappointment. In fact, I feel like a lot of my life has been just one disappointment after another. Maybe your parents disappointed you. Maybe a partner, a friend disappointed you. Maybe just the things that you'd really hoped your life would be about don't seem to be close to you at all. Today, You can evict disappointment from your heart. You can say, no longer, this isn't your home anymore because God's love has been poured into our hearts. They're not good roommates, disappointment and God's love. They don't cohabit very well. And you and I sometimes just need to say, okay, enough is enough. God's love, you're welcome here. Pour it out, Holy Spirit, pour it out into my life and into my heart and allow me to welcome in the great and expansive and enormous love of God, the love that says, I want to give you not just eternal life, but life right now to the full. And disappointment will want to leave. Sometimes the disappointment with our own circumstances becomes a barrier where we can't seem to find the love of God in our heart. But today, friend, I truly believe the Holy Spirit is here and at work. I truly believe that he wants you to be overwhelmed with his great love, understanding that no matter where you've come from or no matter where you are right now, you have an opportunity to allow the love of God to overwhelm and flood your heart. Disappointment, no, not here. Distraction, number two. Hebrews 12, two, one of my favourite scriptures, fixing our eyes on Jesus the pioneer and perfecter of faith. For the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. You know, distraction isn't a new issue. We like to think it's a modern problem. Like, you know, oh, we're so distracted today. Like, how distracted have you been? I've been very distracted. Well, I've been more distracted than you. We set little distraction timers on our, you know, work top. What are they called? Oh, things. And uh, we, we're just so obsessed with being distracted and not being distracted that I think sometimes we're distracted by how distracted we are. Like we, we've got issues with distraction. But it's not a new problem. There's this guy, the rich young ruler, and he comes to Jesus and he says, oh, Jesus, I've been doing great. You know, I've been tithing and I've been giving to the poor and I've been following all the laws and you know what like read Deuteronomy I've got this I'm good and Jesus says you know what you need to do mate you need to give everything away all your stuff God's not against stuff Jesus isn't against stuff he didn't tell that to everybody else you know what he was against this guy being distracted by all of his stuff It's not a new problem, friends. We get so distracted, so not fixing our eyes on Jesus. We're fixing our eyes on everything else, everything in our lives. And the enemy loves it. He says, if I can get you distracted, you're not going to be guarding your heart above all else. You're going to be like, oh, yeah, I'll get to guarding my heart. I've just got to fix a few things first. And we forget. 
We get distracted genuinely from the things it is that God has put in front of you and I to do. We forget about Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. And we think, excuse me. And we think, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to pioneer and perfect my own faith. That's a good idea. Not. But I do it and you do it. We all do it. We think, you know what, Jesus, I'm I'm fixing my eyes on you on Sunday morning. It's going to be great. When I get to Sunday morning, you know, all of this will go away. And we're distracted. All of this temporal stuff, all of this around, and we forget to guard what's truly valuable, and that's our heart on the inside. Most of you would have some sort of security system on your car and on your house alerting you, hey, there's an intruder. I know you have those pop-ups on your phone. And like, is that someone breaking in or delivering a parcel? (laughs) Statistically, definitely delivering a parcel, given your Amazon history. But could be someone breaking in. So you know what I'm saying? We are distracted people by all the things that go on. But how much attention do we give to the border force of our heart? Don't just get to waltz on in and take all my good stuff. All the stuff that the Holy Spirit has deposited on the inside. Matthew 6, 21 is one of my favorite scriptures and it talks about money. But it talks a lot about everything else. It says this, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. I think what we think this says is where your heart is, there your treasure will be also. But that's not what that scripture says. For a little while, I studied English at university and the order of a sentence kind of matters. And I think this scripture is saying, you know what's going to go first? Your treasure. Where your treasure, I don't know where the scripture's gone. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The also is coming after. So if you and I are caught up in our treasure, and that's not just your bank account, by the way. That's all the things in your life that are really important to you. The people, the job, the career, the identity, all the things in your life, all the treasures in your life, they're going first. And guess what's following? Your heart. Ever bought a new car? And all of a sudden, every second car on the road is that car? Whoa! Whoa! I'd never noticed how many Maseratis there were before. (laughs) I mean, they're everywhere. Here was I thinking this was a unique car and now there's just Maserati. Oh, no. It's all right. I live in the real world. It's okay. We're allowed to have fun in church. It's all right. But where your treasure is, friend, all of a sudden, that's a distraction in your life, right? Wherever your treasure is, friends, that's your focus. That's your heart. That's what you're looking at. That's what you're concentrating on. And if you and I get so distracted and we forget that, in fact, it's Jesus, we're not going to be looking at him. We're going to be looking at everything else, everywhere else, what they're doing, what they've got. Instead of the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. The way we guard against distraction is to fix our eyes. Fix our eyes. Gaze at him. Look at Jesus. Look at him. You know what? When you look at Jesus, what do you see? Overwhelming love. Grace upon grace. Mercy for your life. Mercy for your family and your soul. Friends, you can't look at Jesus truly and see judgment and see shame. They're not there with him. What's with Jesus is love and grace and life and life to the full. The third thing, the third enemy is distance. Disappointment, it'll take you out. It'll break your heart. Distraction, you'll just forget to guard it altogether. You'll be looking everywhere else. And distance. John 15, verse 4 to 9. I'm going to read you the whole passage. It says, 
like this. Jesus is talking and he says, remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire and burnt. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Now remain in my love. If you and I want to flourish in life, this is it. This is the key. This is the secret source above all else. Jesus says it so clearly. If you don't remain in me, you've got nothing. If you don't remain in me, your heart is a mess. If you don't remain in me, you can think that you're running your life all you like, but you have no fruit. But the good news about that, friends, is this. Guess what I have to do? Remain. I mean, I am not the cleverest person in the room for sure, but I can remain. Have you noticed something about my friend Gerard? He's real good at standing still. Um, I I am definitely not good at standing still. Uh, Gerard, I'd say almost immovable. Very almost, very almost immovable. This week I want you to think about remaining. Not remaining in judgment, not remaining in fear, Not remaining in paralyzed, I don't know what to do with my life. I really wish I'd get some guidance. Jesus says, remain in my love. Remain in the place where you are underneath the immense and overwhelming love that Jesus has for you. Remain there. Oh, and you'll bear fruit. You won't even have to strive. You won't even have to struggle. You won't even have to strain. You know why? Because the love of God that begins to be poured out in your life will bear fruit without measure. So easy to get distance in between you and someone else. You know, disappointment can happen in a moment, an event, a thing that goes on. Oh, I'm so disappointed. Distractions just all around us, everywhere we look. But distance takes time. I don't ever set out to be distant. But you know, it's just like one step back, one step away, one conversation that makes you feel a bit awkward, one interaction where you think, oh, I'm not really, not really in anymore. And all of a sudden... I'm distant. I'm getting further away. Getting just a bit further away. And then there's an enemy who sounds like an annoying cat. (laughs) You didn't do your devotions yesterday. You're probably far away from God right now. Remember how you sinned? Remember how you swore under your breath when your boss walked away? Remember how you said you would take the bin out and you didn't? That's not your wife, that's the devil. And all of a sudden, what was on Encounter Weekend, such a close and intimate relationship where you felt like nothing was ever going to separate you from the love of God. We got to the end of August and there's a whole lot of distance. And the enemy goes, oh, that was easy. Just a few annoying mares cross between a sheep and a crying baby. <laughs> you and I will never flourish in distance, ever. This scripture tells me that the only way I flourish, the only way that John 10, 10, life is my reality is when I am close, when my heart is guarded and say, enemy, you know what happens? Nothing happens that separates me from the love of God. No circumstance, nothing else in my life. I refuse it. You know why? I'm guarding my heart against the distance that the enemy wants to put in between me and Jesus. 
I wish this scripture said, come to me and I'll guard your heart for you. You just chill. (laughs) But it says, above all else, you guard your heart with all diligence. You know why? Because everything in your life is going to come out of that. Every part of your life. If you want a flourishing life, it's going to come out of what you've allowed into your heart. And friends, today, I just know. I just know there's people here. And disappointment has taken up a whole room. I want you to evict it this morning. I want you to say, you don't belong here anymore. I'm setting up a guard. I'm setting up security. I'm setting up a border force. Saying, you know what's allowed in here? The love of God, the grace of God, the peace of Jesus Christ. Team, you can come and join me and Gerard. Some of you, you just know that you've allowed things to come and distract you from what it is that God is trying to do on the inside of you. You've allowed outside things to come in. And you've said, oh, it's probably not that important. It's probably not that big a deal. But you know right now, your heart is distracted. Your mind, you just can't stay on track. Sometimes you come to open the word and you think, I just, I just this doesn't even make sense anymore. Because you've allowed something of distraction to get on the inside of you. For some of us, it's distance. And you know what? You've barely even realized that it was going on while it was happening. But today, friends, Jesus wants to come near. Scripture says that if you and I would draw near to him, he will draw near to you. That distance that took months to eventuate, in a moment, God says, you can draw near to me today. You can come in one moment and say, oh God, I repent. I want to be close to you. And this morning, I truly believe that God is here and he wants to be close to each one of us this morning. No one is exempt from this. There's not one of us in this room where God would say, no, I want you to keep your distance. I want you to stay away. It doesn't matter what you've done this morning. It doesn't matter what your week has looked like. It doesn't matter what circumstance you find yourself in right now. More than anything, Jesus wants you to be close. He wants there to be no distance between your heart and His heart. So this morning, I would love it if we could pray together. There's some of you here and you wanna say, God, I'm sorry, I've walked away. Maybe it's your first time and you just feel like God is far away from you and you've never been close to Him. All it takes is a simple moment of saying, I want to come close to you, Jesus. I want you to be in my life. I want you to be in my heart. You're welcome. Scripture says it like this. Jesus stands at the door of our heart and he knocks. And you and I have a chance to open that door. To say, come in. Come in. Come and fill me with your love. Come and fill me with your grace. Come and overwhelm my life and my heart with all that you've promised. Why don't we stand together, church? Hebrews 12, 2, I read it to you before. He's the author, the beginning, the alpha and the omega, the author and the perfecter of your faith and mine. And this morning I've asked the team if they would lead us in this song again, what he's done. My obligation today is to come to Him, to draw near. You don't need to worry about perfecting your faith. He's going to do that. Just allow Him in this morning, friends. Just in this moment, if you're one of those people and you said, I feel distant from God. I don't know exactly where I stand with Him. I'm not even sure about my eternity. Right now in this moment, I want to give you an opportunity to say yes to Jesus. People all around this room have have done this before, but maybe today is your day where you're like, you know what? My time's up. I'm saying yes. Jesus, would you come? Would you live in me? Would you bring me that love and that peace? 
just while people have their eyes closed in this place today, if that's you and you say, would you, would you let me be a part of that prayer? Just give me a wave. We're gonna pray together in just a moment. I'm not gonna ask you to do anything scary, but I do wanna pray for you. I do want you to be able to say yes to Jesus in this moment today. And if that's you, I'm looking for you and God's looking for you this morning. You can just give me a wave and say, that's me. Today's my day. I need to say yes to Jesus. Give me a wave if that's you. So good. I can see hands up there. Anybody else? You want to say yes to Jesus this morning? You want to say, that's me. I'm distant from God, but today's my day to come close. Lord Jesus, I thank You for those people right now. And in this moment, I thank You that as they draw their heart near to You, Lord God, You promised that You would draw near to them. Lord God, I thank You for Your grace and Your love that is going to overwhelm their lives right now. In Jesus' name, amen.